Hey, how's everybody doing? My name is Chris Wagner, and I'm the Militant Thomist. So, this this day, I usually say this week, but I guess I have multiple streams in a week, so that'd be inaccurate. But we will be going over a little bit about the development of doctrine from uh, Gary Gou Lagrange. I was reading in his reality, Synthesis of Thomistic Thought, and this is the second time I've, I've read through it, but... I read a section on uh, what he calls the evolution of dogma, and I was thinking about that in relation to St. Newman and his um, evolution of Catholic dogma and his development of Christian doctrine. And I thought that Gergou Lagrange actually explains, um, he's he, it's only a section, but I think he explains it a little bit better. Um, I don't think they're in contradiction necessarily, but I think when you read Lagrange, it's a it's a key to opening up uh, what Newman means, because Newman, he's he's an Englishman and he explains uh, with very um, high rhetoric a lot of these ideas in many pages. He's not as concise and uh, to the point. So I think Lagrange actually explains um, a lot of these things better um, than than Newman does. So I think it's helpful to to also go over what he says in, in reality. And then also in his commentary on Prima Pars, his, um, his work De Deo Trino, um, I think he has another helpful section where he applies this idea to the idea of the Trinity, which is going to help us um, apply some of the concepts that he's going to theoretically bring forth in, in reality. So that's what we're going to be going over today. But before that, um, remember, um, always, you need to know Greek. And if you don't know Greek, then you should go to fluentgreekantit.com and use the code MILITANT for 20% off. Also, um, remember to subscribe and like, and then to also go to patreon.com slash militantomist if you would like to help me do more of this stuff. And if you go to christianbwagner.com slash shop, I have books books and stuff that you can get that I've reprinted. A lot of helpful stuff there. I can't think of anything. I know um, Father Hunter does cover um, the development of doctrine in his outlines of dogmatic theology. I'm trying to think what else would be. I can't think of anything else. Um, any one of the other books where the authors talk about the development of doctrine. But remember, um, get a book. So let's get right into it and then also uh i have been i have been fine i have not died the last few days i was just on vacation so that is why i haven't posted a stream in a few days so i will share my screen okay let's get right here so it's going to be his synthesis of thomistic thoughts let's see which i think it's chapter six this is actually a really good section. I think I might go over other parts of the section too. So in the nature of theological work, this is very helpful with understanding how theology works. Um, I think there's a lot of prolegomena issues with how theology works that people don't necessarily cover a lot. They don't, they don't start on these basis of first principles. And um, as St. Thomas says in De Ente et Essentia, uh, when you mess up on first principles, you're going to mess up the whole system. Uh, that that's obviously a paraphrase, but he, he that's that's the idea that he gets at. And when you have people who are messing up on these first principles of theology, and they may be covering, uh, they may be experts in history, or they may be experts in uh, biblical studies, but when they don't think of the first principles that you get um, in theology. When they're working out their systems um, through various means, they do often mess up and um, the results are disastrous. So I think what contemplating these first principles of theology is going to be very helpful. So I'll do further streams on the other articles of this chapter because they are very helpful. But it's going to be chapter six, article three, the evolution of dogma. And note, um, this term, evolution of dogma, is a very charged term. You'll get a lot of people who will uh, make a... I'm going to make this bigger, actually. Who will make a distinction between the evolution of dogma and the development of doctrine. 
uh, it's it's the same thing. Um, so it's 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 really the same thing. Uh, you'll get in non English speaking authors, they'll usually refer to the evolution of dogma. You'll get it in Sola. You'll even get it in Newman when he's writing in Latin. But the evolution of dogma and development of doctrine, they're the same thing. Um, although when you do get uh, some of the heretical modernist writers writing about the evolution of dogma, they're writing about a different idea of the evolution of dogma, of really the apostolic deposit um, somehow growing. That's going to be their idea that they that they get very wrong. But obviously, Gary Gould Lagrange is not a modernist, um, yet he's still using this language of evolution of dogma. Another good article, um, Bessarian, if you go to his um, his Twitter, uh, he wrote an article on Sola's idea of the evolution of dogma that's really, really good. So if you if you just read that article, um, that, that's going to help you with a lot of these concepts. So let us continue. So I will start here. The conception of theology outlined in the foregoing pages. Though it denies the definability of theological conclusions, properly so called, it still occupies an important place in the evolution of dogma. St. Thomas is certainly not unacquainted with dogmatic process. So note, I have, I have a video that I've done before on St. Thomas uh, on the development of doctrine. He very clearly has this idea, although there's not a certain place that you can really go to where he uh, lays out the principles. He definitely is working with this concept of the development of doctrine. Let us but recall his remarks concerning uh, Venaccio hunting in his commentary on the later analytics on how to find first a definition that is merely nominal, quid nominis, which expresses a confused notion of the thing defined, and second, how to pass from this nominal definition to one that is clear, distinct, and real. So this is a very important concept with uh, within philosophy is when you have a certain object, you first have a nominal distinction. So clear, you just, uh, let's say you have a, a person, you have that nominal distinction of human being that you're going to be working with. And then as you um, consider the genus and then the differentia, so the differences, and as you consider the, the things which make it distinct and real, you're gonna pass from that nominal de definition of um, of human being to a real definition, which is going to be of a rational animal, of rationality and animality. So you're going to have that uh, that general category of animal, and you're going to find that distinct um, difference, that differentia, which is going to be rationality. So this is how uh, also um, the dogmatic process, so the evolution of dogma is going to work, is you're going to be going from confused notions, merely nominal notions, so you may have something like, let's say, um, real presence. You're going to have Eucharistic presence, which that's going to be a nominal um, sort of definition. Then you're going to be going to a real and distinct and clear definition of uh, transubstantiation. So you're going to be moving from nominal to real. And that's going to be that process which is going to happen in the theologian's mind and then also in the mind of the church when it comes to these, these notions which are present in the New Testament. And over time, they're going to be further uh, defining uh, what it means. So it's important to think of this process of the evolution of dogma in terms of definition, in terms of uh, more clear notions which are presented by the church. So let us continue. The more important task, both of philosophy and of theology, lies in this methodic step from the confused concept of common sense or of Christian sense, to a concept that is clear and distinct. This process is not that from premise to conclusion. So this is very interesting, is when we think of this process of the development of doctrine, and although in the past that I've described it as um, this, this process from, from premise to conclusion, that is actually not as accurate. And uh, Lagrange has helped me really understand this is the way that, that most are going to think of it is, okay, you have this, this certain premise which is given in the New Testament, and then you're going to be bringing about uh, conclusions from these premises. 
which although that can uh, define in a certain sense how doctrinal development is going to work when it comes to um, the certain dogmas of the church it is going to be uh, better described as this process from nominal to real uh, definitions from common sense to concepts that are clear and distinct is that's going to be a more helpful way of describing it so rather we deal with one concept all the way through a concept at first generic becoming by precision specific and then by induction distinguishing from concepts which are more or less closely resemble it in this fashion have we reached the precise definitions now prevailing of substance of life of man of soul of intellect of will of free will and of the various virtues so the same, this same conceptual analysis has furnished great contributions to the refining of concepts indispensable in dogmatic formulations of being, say, uncreated and created, of unity, of truth, of goodness, ontological and moral, concepts further of analogy relative to God, of divine wisdom, of the divine will, of uncreated love, of providence, of predestination, or again of nature, of person, of relation, and giving precise formulations to the teaching on the Trinity and the incarnation, of grace, free will, merit, sin, virtue, faith, hope, charity, justification, of sacrament, character, sacramental grace, transubstantiation, contrition, of beatitude, pain and purgatory and hell, and so on. So all of all of these examples, you're going to see a distinct difference in the way in which theologians in the first few centuries of the church, especially in the Antonicene um, definitions of things, and then the Tridentine uh, definitions of things, or the definitions of the schools um, in the in the post-Tridentine church, you're going to find different definitions. But this is really the contemplation of the church. It was able to make better definitions and to have clearer concepts of what these things are than they had before. But it's really, as he says up there, it's really the same concept all the way through. It's, this, it's the same way in which we may at first have a nominal definition of human being. And then over time, uh, considering uh, genus and differentia, be able to make a real definition of human being. It's that same process which is going to happen over and over and over again with this conceptual analysis over time. So thus we see that immense conceptual labor is pre-required before we can proceed to deduce theological conclusions. Confused concepts expressed in nominal definitions or in current terms of scripture and tradition must become distinct and precise if we would refute the heresies that deform revelation itself. Long schooling is needed before we can grasp the profound import, sublimity, and fertility of the principles which faith give us. So when, when heresies come up, um, it's, not, it's not that we're defining, um, well, it's not that we're bringing forth new uh, ideas that weren't present before. We're, we're not saying, okay, heresy comes up. I guess we need to um, guess we need to bring up this doctrine, which is a theological conclusion from other doctrines. So for example, the consubstantiality of the the Father and the Son. That was that was present in concept before. Um, it's merely defined at Nicaea in order to to fight a certain heresy. But what, what's happening is we're having those principles, those concepts which faith give us. And then we're considering using the process of definition and bringing forth a true definition of those certain terms using the, the uh, development of doctrine. So here lies the most, most important contribution of theological science to dogmatic de uh, development. And the degree of merit which a theological system will have in efficacious promotion of this development will depend on the universality of its synthesis. A synthesis generated from the idea of God, author of all things, in the order both of nature and of grace, must necessarily be universal, whereas a synthesis dominated by particular, partial, and subordinated concepts, the free will of man, say, cannot reach a true universality, attainable only under the spiritual sun which illumines all parts of the system. So we must necessarily, um, in this, in this, uh, this uh, system of dogmatic development, 
bring together in a in a synthesis all of these uh, dispersed concepts out here. You have the concept here, you have the concept there, you have the concept here and there. And we must uh, bring to fore all of those concepts in the entirety of the system, working from the ground up, working from these principles of the system up into a coherent whole. We must bring about and we must connect um, all of these in order to have a, a truly good system. As, as you have with scripture and tradition, they're giving us all of these um, dispersed concepts, which isn't necessarily wrong. They're, they're giving us all of these concepts um, in, in certain language. Um, they, they may, uh, let's say, in the fourth century authors, they're giving us a lot of these concepts about the Trinity and about the Incarnation. They're giving us these concepts, but then um, they're not giving us necessarily a synthesis because they're working uh, polemically. They're fighting certain errors. So they're, they're not considering, uh, for example, over here you may have, let's say, the, the free will of man. Over here you may have sacramentology. Over here you may have all of these different concepts that they're not really bringing to bear on the entirety of the system. And this is, for example, uh, we, when we think of later developments in Trinitarian thought, this is why the Latin synthesis is so much better than the Greek synthesis uh, when it comes to Trinitarian thought. Because with the Latins, they're working in terms of a, of a certain uh, theological system, which is coherent, uh, which, which was debated in the schools, where in Greek thought, a lot of the development happens polemically, is they're really... Um, focused on particular concepts um, rather than focused on the entire uh, synthesis of their system uh, with working with those uh, metaphysical principles that they have. So what, what you have with the, with the Greek synthesis of Trinitarian thought is you have a system which is, uh, how, do, how do I put this nicely? You have a, you have a system which which focuses on certain things at the expense of other things, which really hurts those certain things which they focus on. Because in order to have a, um, a healthy system, which wherein you have certain um, ideas which feed into other ideas which are going to really uh, help you out, um, you must have all of those ideas um, equally developed. So this is what this is really the beauty of scholasticism is scholasticism is so rigid um, in its in its definitions of everything in its working trying to work everything together into a whole working from metaphysical principles to being able to explain um, those those theological conclusions that you have to be able to define those dogmas that you have in in terms of genus and uh, differentia being able to have all of that, um, the each of these concepts fit together, and they feed into one another to be able to uh, provide that that good synthesis that you have in scholasticism. That's why it's so uh, difficult and takes so many uh, so much time and effort to be able to um, to bring in these philosophical concepts and to bring in all of these disparate areas of theology. It's a lot of a lot of hard work. Uh, whereas in other systems, you you can just kind of jump in wherever you want, and you don't really need um, to consider all of these things. It's a lot of hard work to be able to um, imbibe an entire synthesis and to be able to imbibe an entire system rather than these little concepts. But the hard work pays off because in having all of in having this synthesis, in having all of the concepts that fit together, uh, you are really able to um, to to understand each one of the singular concepts a lot better uh, rather than um, a, a strictly a polemical focus like you'll get in a lot of the Greek writing on certain topics. I'm going to check the, the live chat really quick. What? What is Barely Protestant saying? I don't know what he's saying. But I will continue. So, oh, wait, no, that's the, uh, there you go. So I think this image is actually really helpful. So as image of the relation between theological systems and faith, we suggest a polygon inscribed in a circle. 
The circle stands for the simplicity and superiority of the doctrines of faith. The inscribed polygon with its many angles contains the rich details of the theological system. The polygon traced by nominalism differs from that, uh, from that initiated by St. Augustine and elaborated by St. Thomas. But even if it is conceived as perfect as possible, the polygon can never have the transcendent simplicity of the circle. Theology likewise, and the more it advances, the more does it humiliate itself before the superiority of that faith, which never ceases to set in relief. Theology is a commentary ever drawing attention to the word of God, which it comments on. Theology, like the Baptist, forgets itself in the cry, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So to explain this, um, this idea a little bit, so imagine you have a, a circle. This is, this is my attempt at a circle. You have this circle right here. Uh, that is those uh, dogmas of faith existing um, in, say, so existing in itself. So you have that, let's say, you have right here incar the incarnation, the, the reality of the incarnation um, as a dogma of faith, which abides in the believer um, through the infused virtues, exists right here as a circle out there in reality. Now, what you have inside the circle is you have a little, little triangle. So you have a circle right here. We have a little triangle um, in there. So that little triangle might be, I don't know. Um, let's think of St. Irenaeus. And uh, no, 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 let's go back even further. Um, actually, no, St. Irenaeus. And he's talking about basically uh, the idea Jesus Christ is God and man. That's the, the, the simplest uh, way in which you can phrase it is that little little triangle right there. Now, over time, you may add another angle as we further define um, what it means for Jesus Christ to be uh, to be God and man. You, you, you change from that circle to a little square when you start expressing, OK, let's let's express it in terms of um, nature and hypostasis. Let, let's change that little little uh, triangle to a little square. Now, a square um, actually takes up more of the area and patterns itself more after the circle. So if you add, let's say you have some more um, distinctions and definitions that are made. Let's go from Ephesus to uh, Chalcedon. You may add a few angles onto that. So now let's say you have a hexagon. So you have that little uh, hexagon um, inside of the circle. It's patterning itself even more and more um, after the circle. It's, it's taking up more of the area. It's getting closer to, to that circle. And let's add like, when, when you get to the Thomistic synthesis of the incarnation, let's add like 10 other angles and well, 10 other sides. And you have like a 16-sided shape. And as you add more and more and more sides, you're getting closer and closer and closer to a circle. This is, um, if you have a math background, you'll, you'll understand this, this analogy a lot better. Because uh, a circle is really a, a polygon uh, with an infinite uh, number of sides. Uh, that's how calculus treats a circle. But as, as the synthesis goes on, as our definitions get even better, you are, you're not reaching um, ever. That, that idea of the circle. But as you get more sides, you get closer and closer and closer and closer, and you fill up more and more and more and more of that area of the circle. Um, that same concept, which has always exists, that same concept of faith abiding in, in the believer and abiding, uh, that object abiding in reality still exists. But as the theologian um, and as the church contemplates that mystery, we in our, in our increasingly precise definitions are able to fill up more of that circle with having more sides and being able to define it a little bit um, better. Yes, development uh, only occurs insofar as the essence of the Catholic faith interacts with the existence of the material world. The faith does not change, um, essentially change. Yes, it is all um, in what, what's called in subiecto. So it's all in the subject. So in the church and in the individual theologian, as we're um, contemplating and defining these concepts better, we're able to um, fill up more of that circle of that of dogma of faith, which exists in reality rather than uh, in us. So I'm going to go now to the second part of this, which he's going to apply it when it comes to the, the Trinity. 
So note on evolution of dogma or the progressive understanding of dogma. And if you'll give me just one minute, I need to grab water. My throat is so dry. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. And now, I've been waiting for this week. Let's see what I got. Blackberry lemonade. I've never had this before, so. I guess it's okay. It's not the best. But let us continue. So, this is going to be, uh, it's specifically going to be on the Trinity. This is really what everybody wonders about is the relationship between uh, the patristic, well, the anti-Nicene doctrine of the Trinity and the Nicene doctrine of the Trinity. And um, this is what he's going to be covering right here, because this is in the midst of him proving the, the Trinity from the Church Fathers in his commentary on Prima Pars. So the definition of the Council of Nicaea on the consubstantiality of the word is clearly nothing more than an explanation or more explicit statement of the proposition contained in the prologue of St. John's Gospel, the word was God. So think about it, think about it now in our in terms of our of our circle and then our polygon inside of the circle. And polygon, if, if you don't know, uh, if you somehow didn't graduate uh, high school geometry or you just don't remember, polygon is just a shape with sides. So a triangle is a polygon and then a square is a polygon with one more side and then a, then a pentagon and then a hexagon and then a septagon and then an octagon. And then you, you continue as you uh, add more signs. But thinking of the word was God, that concept, um, that that uh, that reality of the incarnation is that circle. And then at the at the very beginning, uh, that that statement, the word was God. The word was God is like that little triangle we have. That is a an absolutely correct statement. The word was God. And that's not to um not to uh, say that the that the biblical expression of the incarnation uh, is bad or anything. It's just saying that it is it is um bare bones. It's true. Um it's absolutely true but it's bare bones. So the word was God is a is a true statement. And then when you go from the word was God to that definition and expression of consubstantiality, consubstantiality is going to add that extra side and make it into a square. And it's going to cover a little bit more of that, that concept when it comes to a more explicit and, um, and uh, more definitive uh, and clear definition. But they're both going to be something which is, which is nevertheless true. And it's going to, it's just going to pattern itself after the dogma in a, in a different way. The word was God is going to be something that you can just, you can just throw at somebody. But once we start asking questions to be able to uh, define it in more and clearer terms, you're going to move from that, that square you have to maybe, um, I don't know, a, a septagon. You're going to have that seven sided shape that's going to uh, pattern itself um, more after that circle. So let's continue. The consubstantiality is not arrived at by an objectively illative process. So an objectively illative process is going to be, um, which to do, uh, he actually explains it, which deduces a new truth from another, as for example, when we conclude that a man is free from the fact that he is rational. So we, we have as the definition of a man, the fact that he is a rational animal. And then from the fact of rationality, we can conclude that man is free. Uh, that is a conclusion that we make from a certain premise. This is not the way at which it works 
when we conclude um, consubstantiality. Consubstantiality is contained um, uh, uh, implicitly in that proposition, the word was God. So it's not a conclusion. It's just an explanation of something which was already there. And um, so when we think of the, the, the evolution of dogma, it's not that illative process, that objectively illative process where we go um, like in theology when we uh, draw out certain doctrines we go from uh, premise to conclusion premise to conclusion premise to conclusion that's the way in which uh, we draw out certain doctrines but we can't draw out dogmas like that the the process of which we uh, derive um, dogmas um, is not going to be uh, like consubstantiality is not a new uh, dogma, which is which is drawn out from the word was God, but it's something which was already contained in that idea that the word was God. It's just a sharper definition, if you want to put it in that way. To arrive at the knowledge of this consubstantiality, an expletive process. So rather than illative, an elation is just um, in reference to uh, the process of 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 premise to conclusion, an explicative, explicative, I, that, that word is very hard to say, explicative process is sufficient. So explicative is explanation. It's that sharper definition that we were talking about before in his um, reality is sufficient, or at the most a subjectively illative process by which the mind proceeds to the deduction of a new truth. So Think of it. Think of it in this way. Um, if if you've ever heard me uh, explain what a minor virtual distinction is, so minor virtual distinction is something which is going to not be really distinct from the other. For example, when we say uh, that the the sun is God, the relationship between sun and God is that of a minor virtual distinction. There's not a real distinction, so we're the the two aren't uh, split off and separated before the consideration of the mind, but it's also not a nominal distinction. So there's some, uh, what's called fundamentum in re. There's a, there's a fun foundation in reality for this distinction. And the one explains the other. So son explains God, although son and God are not uh, split off and different. So in the same way, uh, when it comes to consubstantiality and then um, the word was God, there is not this uh, real distinction where the two are split off and separated, but there's also not a nominal distinction where the two are collapsed into one another. Uh, consubstantiality is a has a uh, has a foundational. Um, there, there's a foundation for the difference between the explanation of consubstantiality and the word was God, but it's only in the consideration of our mind that we are able to make this further definition. So I hope that makes sense. Um, by the simple explicative process, the second statement is shown to be equivalent to an earlier simpler proposition. So these are the same, but it is an explicative process which draws out consubstantiality from the idea of the word is God, and they are equivalent. It's not a new truth which is deduced. Okay, so I will take a sip. So the explicative process is most easy. God is one, but the indivisible and infinite divine nature cannot be multiplied. The monotheism is manifestly based on faith, for as we read, where, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I, uh, see ye that uh, I alone am, and there is no other God besides me. And Jesus answered him, the Lord thy God is one God. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, but there is no God but one. So the fact that God is one is established right here. On the supposition of monotheism, we read further, and the word was God, or the word, the only begotten son of God, is God like the Father. Therefore, the Father and God are consubstantial. That is, they are not distinct with regard to essence and substance, but only by reason of paternity and filiation, which is the opposition of relation. And Jesus said, I am the truth and the life. This process does not attain a new truth deduced from that revealed truth, and the word was God, but it simply explains it on the supposition that monotheism is established.
Therefore, in spite of what has been said by recent students, the divine cons consubstantiality is not a theological conclusion sanctioned by definition. So what we have is when we have this premise in scripture and the word was God, what the way in which uh, consubstantiality is reached by that is we consider through scripture how we're going to be defining God. And then also, how are we going to be defining word? And also, how are we going to be defining was? So by further contemplation in the definition of each one of these terms, on that supposition of monotheism, we're going to reach consubstantiality. And also in the synthesis of these various truths. So really, the, the, the entirety of the doctrine of the Trinity, the entire sublimity and uh I don't know. Uh, no, I think Prima Pars is is in my car. Actually, I was reading it on lunch, but um, lunch last night. So the entirety of that second half of Prima Pars, all that really is, is just an uh, the explicative process, um, which is applied to the proposition that the Word was God. So in, in the synthesis of these various truths, which are presented in sacred scripture, we come to that systematic uh, output, which is found in scholasticism. So it's nothing but that explicative process. So St. Athanasius, from another approach, proves the consubstantiality by a proper illative process from two revealed premises. St. Athanasius declares, only God deifies or makes divine by participation. But the word of God deifies, therefore he is God, and consequently homoousas with the Father, from whom he proceeds not by creation, but by generation in the identity of nature. So with this illative process that St. Athanasius uses, this is going to be uh, actually something which is um, what what's said to be um, a posteriori. So it's going to be something which is after the fact and something which is going to be proving the rationality of the faith. It's going to be an argument for it, but that's not how we uh, deduce that idea of, um, of the doctrine, the dogma itself. So Father Mar Marine Sola teaches, the consubstantiality defined by the Council of Nicaea was a revealed truth, but where and how was it revealed? It was revealed in other truths, which contained it implicitly, and from where it was deduced by reasoning. These truths are, one, Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. Two, in God there is a simple unity and there can be no division of substance. At this point, we depart from sola, holding that consubstantiality is not really a theological conclusion, but a truth of faith more explicitly stated. So he's going to depart from sola here, where sola says it's a conclusion, but Lagrange is not going to say it's a conclusion. Having posited the revealed proposition, the word was God, no objectively illative process is required to understand consubstantiality. This consubstantiality does not express a new truth, but the same truth in a more explicit manner. As when we proceed from the nominal definition of man to a real and explicit definition, namely, namely man is a rational animal. If certain theologians like Bellarmine say that consubstantiality is deduced, it is deduced by the explicative process, or perhaps, as we have said, by an illative process from two premises already revealed. Here we must also keep in mind the transition from concrete knowledge to abstract knowledge. Abstract knowledge is already contained implicitly, and not only virtually, and the concrete knowledge of the same thing and the transition is made without any objectively illative process. In this way, St. Athanasius argued to prove the divinity of the Holy Ghost against the Arians and the Macedonians. Inasmuch as the Holy Ghost sanctifies us, that is, deifies us by our participation in the deity, furthermore, St. Athanasius said, the Father begets necessarily and at the same time freely, and he does not create necessarily but freely. In explanation, he says that the Father necessarily and freely loves himself, but not as a matter of choice. It follows that in God, generation is eternal. Since God was always the Father, and similarly, spiration is eternal, otherwise neither the Son nor the Holy Ghost would be God, because they would not then be eternal. And refuting the Arians, St. Athanasius concluded, 
Nothing created can be found in the Trinity, since it is entirely one God. After the Nicene Council, many other councils confirmed the teaching against the Macedonians, who had denied the divinity of the Holy Ghost, particularly the Fourth Council of Rome and the Council of Constantinople, which expressly defined that the Holy Ghost was God. With this, we conclude the, the testimony of tradition, for after the Nicene Council, the Church clearly taught the mystery of the one God in three distinct persons. Okay. So I will take questions if you have any. I'll give you guys a minute. Oh, and I should probably... Oh, too late. I already exited out of them. Yeah, and if you guys have any ideas for other stuff you'd like me to, to cover, I do take uh, recommendations. Okay, I do not see any questions. So I'll be I'll be live in a few minutes actually for another stream. I'm just going to do one on another one of the books I published. So I will see you guys then if you're going to transition over. And it is Easter and Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia. Alleluia.